Yeah, dude. Ah. <laughs> Get ready. This is going to be gnarly. <laughs> Pretty gnarly. <laughs> kind of gnarly. <laughs> We're all making jokes and whatnot, but I am a little worried about him right now. This is a penis strangler. That's all that is. It's in a hot topic, though. <laughs> to hold him up, it's already cutting off the circulation. And the rope is just the thinnest thing I've ever seen. It looks rather iffy. I don't think that's going to hold you up. Are we ready? Yeah. Put your head back. You do not want a ball to hit your head. Yeah. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, 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 my God, it's too nice. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Oh, for the nuts. Wish me luck getting to Denver. Denver is a pipe dream. guys you know no matter who you are being duct taped to the side of a truck flying down the highway is pretty goofy but when you stop feeling your limbs because hypothermia is setting in as you're cruising through Colorado winter then it's intense and when you're doing all of this while you're on probation that's fucking hilarious I'm still on probation for a slew of charges that I caught that one time when I was protesting SeaWorld. Right? Yeah. yeah, I was protesting SeaWorld at a random construction site nowhere near SeaWorld. I showed up and I climbed up a 150 foot tall crane with an inflatable toy whale. Turns out when you're 150 feet up in the air, nobody can see your stupid fucking toy whale. <laughs> While I was climbing up that crane, enough people called 911 that by the time I was up there and got my whale inflated, there were 80 firefighters, 18 cops, a helicopter, and a SWAT team. And I know that's tough to believe, but those were the exact numbers in the police report. So I'm up on top of this crane. I'm looking down at all of that. That is a lot. I'm thinking, I am in trouble <laughs> already. I should probably go ahead and blow up all the fireworks I brought. So I started lighting off these huge fireworks, the kind that make a big display in the sky. And I did that while the police helicopter was circling around me. And they did not like that. Then I climbed down and I was arrested. The very next day I hired a lawyer and I asked this guy, when we go to court, do you think you could get me just jail time? <laughs> and he was confused as fuck. He says, why would you want to go to jail? I told him, because I was trying to make a statement about captivity. <laughs> I said, if we could get me locked up for this, that would be the only part of my plan that made any fucking sense. <laughs> now, there was no way around me getting probation, but we succeeded in getting me sentenced to 30 days in LA County Jail. And I was really psyched about it because there's nothing sexy about picking up trash off the highway, but Steve O's going to jail, that's a headline. And if nothing else, I am an attention whore. 
And I'm also a minor celebrity. So I knew that when I went to jail, I would be in what's called protective custody, meaning that nobody would ever be allowed in my cell. I'd never be in any danger. And I could jack off as much as I wanted. <laughs> So I showed up at that correctional facility gung-ho. I surrendered myself to do my 30 days. And then they let me out in eight hours. <laughs> I didn't even have time to jack off. <laughs> the bad part was that they sent me a bill for 80 firefighters, 18 cops, a helicopter, and a SWAT team. So I want to thank you guys for contributing to the Fuck SeaWorld Fund. Yeah! Now, my SeaWorld arrest was not my first. Not even close. I've been to jail so many times, my butthole fell off. <laughs> that was just a joke. Seriously, there's nothing wrong with my butthole, okay? Nothing's ever even been up there. Ah, yeah! All right, I put a bunch of stuff up my butt. Ow! But only for work. Jump, 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 jump! I never enjoyed it. Ah! All right, maybe once. <laughs> when I was a kid, I got locked up a lot for garden variety crime. But when Jackass came out, my criminal record became colorful. When I was arrested for stapling my ball sack to my leg, which you wouldn't think was a crime. It's actually not. It's showing your dick to people that's a problem. But I might have found a way around that. See, women can paint their boobs and show them on Instagram. So I figure I should be able to paint my dick and do whatever I want. And that's how I came up with the idea to put together a hardcore cyclist suit with my 10 speed, my helmet, the spandex shirt, and just paint on the shorts. <laughs> That day I sent a photo of my costume to Johnny Knoxville and he wrote back, that's the smallest black dick I've ever seen. <laughs> and I was not kidding about stapling my nutsack. I've done it a bunch. I'm the only guy in the whole world who's ever been known for ball sack stapling. It's all mine. And I know all the guys are thinking, keep it. <laughs> the first time I ever did it, my buddy Wee Man stapled it for me. It was great. Ah! Oh, you bitch, bitch. Ah! No. Ah! <laughs> ah! But I was legitimately concerned that it might come off more upsetting and grotesque than anything. And I wanted it to be hilarious. So I stapled my ball sack to both of my legs. <laughs> and I called it the butterfly. <laughs> and that made it a lot funnier, but it did not look like a butterfly at all. I'd like to say it looked a little bit like an elephant. <laughs> but it just looked like a dead bat. Ah! Oh, oh, butterfly oh. And when you staple your nutsack twice, that is a lot. Oh my God. <laughs> Son Don't of move. a bitch. Plus I knew I was gonna do it again because it was a hit. <laughs> so it became very important to me to figure out how to only staple it one time and have it be even funnier which was not easy. This took serious research, physics, science, but I dug deep and I cracked the code. When the time came, I pushed my wiener into itself, <laughs> like one of those mushy slinkies. <laughs> then I pulled my nutsack up over everything and stapled it to my stomach. 
and I call that the turtle. And ladies and gentlemen, with me here tonight to demonstrate how much like a turtle it really looks, make some noise for my brother, Weeman! Right here, I got two of my best friends in the world, Tommy Codill and Sam Macaroni. This is so that I can be upside down because experience tells me gravity does not agree with the turtle. You ready? It's pretty amazing to me that I got in so much trouble for that. In the state of Louisiana, they charged me with felony scrotum stapling. <laughs> they called it obscenity. And for that one charge, if you can believe this, I was facing three years in prison. And while I was out on bail, I flew to Europe and got arrested again. There I was in Norway. My buddies were filming me outside of the airport in Oslo as I attempted to swallow a condom which I had filled with marijuana and hash. Didn't need to be complicated, right? Load it up, tie it, swallow it, but I filled it way too much. It was far too big. So when I tried to swallow it, it got stuck in my throat. And I'm freaking the fuck out right away. I'm like, oh no, my beautiful voice. <laughs> But seriously, it was ugly, man. I felt like I was choking to death on a big green cock. It's totally stuck in my throat. I was frantically trying to swallow to get it to go down, but it would not go down. And then I was trying to barf to get it to come up. It wouldn't come up either. I was trying so hard, I was puking up blood. Yeah, it was bad. I didn't know what to do. So I went ahead and I got on the airplane and I flew to Sweden which made me an international drug smuggler. <laughs> when I got to Sweden, my throat was so injured, I couldn't tell if it was still lodged in there or not. And I was terrified, as well as extremely proud. So I called up Johnny Knoxville to brag about it and see if he had any advice. I'll never forget that talk. Knoxville says, ha ha, you're gonna die <laughs> of intestinal strangulation. So the next day when I took my first shit, I was really hoping to see that package in the toilet, but it wasn't there. And I knew that for sure because I dug through it thoroughly. <laughs> but then it wasn't there the day after that, or the day after that. So now I'm in Sweden in a full-blown panic, and I got all these interviews I had to do to promote my tour. So everybody's asking me, how are you enjoying Sweden? And I told them, I'm not. <laughs> I swallowed a big package full of drugs and it won't come out. And now I think I might become the world's first marijuana fatality. It's not a good week. <laughs> well, what I didn't know is that Sweden is the most drug intolerant country in the western half of the world. They fucking hate drugs. And I would not shut up about it. <laughs> when I got back to my hotel room after my big show in Stockholm, I sat on the toilet. It was like the lower half of my body got in a car accident and the airbag deployed out of my asshole. <laughs> I jumped up and looked in the bowl and sure enough, there it was, man. The poo rubber. 
It is hard to describe how thrilled I really was. Yeah! Not only because it was nice to know that I wasn't gonna die, but because I had not been able to find weed all week. <laughs> I was so excited, I ripped it open with my teeth. <laughs> and I dumped all the marijuana and hash onto the desk, grabbed an empty beer can, and very skillfully poked a bunch of holes into it, making it into a pipe. I loaded up that beer can pipe with a good amount of ass grass, you know? Tush kush. <laughs> I clicked a lighter, I took a massive hit, blew the smoke right into the camera, and then I said, that's good shit. <laughs> It was so great. I decided to do a smoking stunt for you guys on stage tonight. So, everybody make some noise for my jackass buddy, Danger Aaron! Yeah! Now, I know everybody likes the way Danger looks better when he has pubic hair glued all over his face. So I've been saving up. Let me get my butler out oh my here. God. My dad always told me I'd be good at something. <laughs> Pretty proud. Oh, Jesus. Wait, let me inspect for crabs this time. <laughs> Looks pretty clean. Why am I the guy like to get pube dick hair on my face? All right, here we go. That's good. Uh, that's, that's enough. That kind of burns, man. What the fuck? I got plenty of pubic hair right here. Oh, man. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. It smells so bad. It smells so bad. Don't worry, man. You got it. You look good. You look good. You guys think I look good? <laughs> All right. Now for my smoking stunt. Oh. I've got a bunch of pubic hair left over. I'm gonna tuck it in between my fingers so I can smoke my own pubic hair out of my bare hand. It stinks, too. All right, you ready? You guys ready for this? All right, here we go. Scott Randolph right here. All right, guys. But back to Sweden. I had a wonderful night smoking the poo load. But the next morning as I left the hotel, I was ambushed by undercover Swedish police officers. They grabbed me, stuffed me into an unmarked car. One of them sat right next to me in the back seat. He's all proud of himself. <laughs> He says, we know you have a package of drugs in your body. <laughs> and I told him, uh-uh. <laughs> I said, I was kidding, man. It was a joke. But they took me to the police station and started going through my backpack. That same fucker, I watched him reach into this one pocket. He pulled out a little pill that I honestly didn't know was there. And when he held it up, I could see that pill had a fucking smiley face on it. He's all, and what is this? I told him, that's not mine. <laughs> Obviously, if I knew it was there, I would have eaten it. <laughs> but they locked me up for possession of ecstasy. Now I'm sitting in a Swedish jail cell, just thinking I'm gonna be there for years. It was fucked up. The only thing that helped me at that dark time was knowing that I was all over the news. <laughs> because that always makes me hard as a rock. <laughs> I was jacking off in my cell, like, oh, I'm so fucking famous right now. Oh. <laughs> famous for being an international butt smuggler, locked up while out on bail for ball stapling, and I never felt more proud. 
The whole time while I was in jail in Sweden, whenever I had to take a shit, I would push an actual doorbell inside my cell, alerting the officers to take me to a special toilet where I would shit into a plastic bag and they would take it and search it for drugs. <laughs> Which I thought was fucking hilarious. <laughs> I think about five days into this program is when it occurred to them, this is getting really embarrassing. Let's just cut this guy loose real quiet. And they let me go. Turned out that was one of the best fucking things that ever happened to me. So recently I celebrated it by performing a new condom stunt. Oh yeah. I invited my jackass buddy Chris Pontius over to my house to jack off into a rubber. Right? He blew a humongous load. I just cemented into a condom. And then he tied it in a knot, came out of the bathroom, and he handed it to me right in front of my father. <laughs> so that we could film my dad's reaction when I put it in my mouth and swallowed it. <laughs> and if you think you guys are disappointed in me, <laughs> My dad has never been a fan of that humor. I'm not doing this to hurt you, Dad. No, you're not gonna hurt me, you're gonna piss me off. <laughs> but all things considered, he handled it really well. Why is this the right thing to do? Is that high protein or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> Jeez, okay. <laughs> Until the next day. See, I'm a healthier guy now, so that cum-filled condom passed through me in less than 24 hours. I pulled it out of the toilet all covered in shit, went running upstairs, Dad, Dad! <laughs> That's gotta be record time. <laughs> Dad did not want to see it at that point. He completely shut down. When you're finished playing, <laughs> Then we can talk. I mean, it's really funny, but ever since I did that, I've been conflicted. I feel like kind of bad, I don't know. So, I brought Chris Pontius so we can talk about it. Come on, Chris Pontius! Now, Chris, do you think that was too much? No, you don't do that to your dad, it's terrible. Oh, I felt terrible. So I should apologize to him? Yeah, yeah, you definitely should. All right, let's get Dad out of here. Come on, Dad! <laughs> Do I deserve an apology for this? Yeah! If this was a normal situation, I'd say yeah, but he has put me through so much shit. <laughs> for so many years, I wasn't too terribly offended. And yeah, you should apologize, and if you do, I'll accept it. Okay, well, I'll do two things. I'll apologize, and I'll call for my butler. Come on, Scott! <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was gonna do this or not, Dad, but I couldn't throw away the shit-covered, oh, cum-filled no. condom. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. of everything you've accomplished. Thank you, Dad. Everybody, make some noise for my dad and Chris Pontius and Scott Randolph. We'll take a clean-up Keith Brig. Chris and Lacey, everybody! <laughs> All right. Wow. I was honestly wondering if that would be too much for anybody. <laughs> but fuck it. And the truth is, I didn't put my family through much of my work stuff. What I terrorized my family with was my crippling drug problem. Fuck, it was bad. And it just got worse. and 
worse. <laughs> of course, I'm making perfect sense. I'm vibrating. I ended up moving into this apartment building in Hollywood, California, where my neighbor called the cops on me all the time for a really good reason. I was getting so high in there on so many different substances, you don't even call it high. It's just <laughs> Fuck fur. See what I'm saying? I would turn into a monster regularly, and the cops were always showing up. Sometimes I would open up the door and they would go, no fucking way, Steve-o, cool. Well, that was a little bit loud, so just tone it down. Sure. You guys are cool, so. Right on, man, thank you, guys. And sometimes they wouldn't. Put it down. I'll give you a shirt. Hey, how about if I just saw me? Just Ladies and gentlemen. I'll put it down. I always promised to behave myself, and I never did. I hate my neighbor! It just got worse and worse. It came to a point where half the time I was yelling at the top of my lungs at voices I was hearing in my head. What the fuck did I do? What I do? Ah! The neighbor's only hearing my half of the conversation. It's fucking creepy. The rest of the time I'm just being an asshole, breaking shit all over the place. <laughs> He keeps calling the cops. I keep getting more and more pissed. I got into the habit of going over to the wall and just bump, bump, bump. How do you like that, motherfucker? <laughs> it's kind of a dick thing to do, but I would only do it in the middle of the night. <laughs> One time I was pounding on it so hard, I broke through that first layer. Lighten up, man. <laughs> or move out now. <laughs> then I went nuts and ripped away all the drywall, right? I made a huge hole just big enough to fit my speakers into. <laughs> so that I could blare death metal music while pounding on the wall. <laughs> Which I absolutely loved to do for minutes on end. And then I would turn everything off and be really quiet. So when the cops showed up, I'd be like, I don't know what he's talking about. That dude is a weirdo. <laughs> and I felt like the cops were starting to believe me. <laughs> but I wasn't winning the neighbor war for long. See, after I got through the drywall, then comes the cotton candy looking fiberglass shit. I ripped that out and huffed it. That's some asbestos, dude. That's what I'm good. Yeah, oh, man, yeah. I'm good at that shit. <laughs> and then I got to the plywood. It was chipboard. One night I decided it was time to break on through to the other side. <laughs> so I got myself a mop, came running through my apartment like a fucking pole vaulter. <laughs> Boom! Boom! I smashed that mop stick through everything till I was standing there looking into the dude's apartment right at him. He flipped off the light super fast, so I'm just looking in blackness. And I go, fuck you, dude. Why don't you call the cops now? And he did. <laughs> And I was so fucked up that night, it did not even occur to me to leave. I just hung out <laughs> until the cops got there. They said, we've got no choice but to take you to jail for vandalism. And I'm standing there cross-eyed, no shirt, no shoes. The cops told me it's gonna be cold in jail. Like as if I didn't know that. <laughs> they said they would let me put on some shoes and a shirt which gave me a really good opportunity to go into my apartment, maybe take the big bag of cocaine out of my pocket, <laughs> throw it behind the sofa or something. But that is not what I did, no. <laughs> I stood right there and told those cops, fuck a shirt, fuck shoes, let's go. And off I went to jail where they've got an annoying habit of making you empty your pockets. <laughs> and I got arrested again. Isn't that cool? You can get arrested while you're getting arrested. <laughs> Proud of that. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. I, I did it so much, I can actually thread my nose with a shoelace. And that's really cool. <laughs> but I don't want to stand here and try and glamorize drug abuse because my problem was honestly so terrible, Johnny Knoxville organized an intervention on me. He found out about this law in California. 
called 5150. It says that if you can prove someone is harmful to themselves, you can lock them up in a psychiatric ward against their will. Now, I have no idea how Knoxville proved that I was harmful to myself. <laughs> but he succeeded in locking me up in the same psychiatric ward that Britney Spears was famously in. I saw this as a great opportunity to network. So here I am in this mental health facility making exciting new friends. And one of these people pulled his pants down right around his ankles, right in front of me. He squatted down and took a humongous shit on the one part of the floor that was carpeted. <laughs> and then he plopped onto it, just the fattest loaf you ever saw, and he's break dancing in it. <laughs> it's what it looked like. It was, ah! <laughs> he was smearing it all over himself. It was a real shit show. <laughs> and about that point is when it occurred to me, I need help. <laughs> and I decided to go to rehab. Now, when I got to rehab, thank you. When I got to rehab, the reality of the disaster my life had become came crashing down. And I got so depressed, I called up one of my best friends, a huge black guy named Big Reg, and I told him, some nights I can't even sleep. I'm laying awake thinking of ways to kill myself. And Big Reg loves me dearly. As soon as he heard that, he said one of the wisest things I've ever heard. The only way you are allowed to kill yourself is to get your dick sucked to death. I love you, Everybody, Big Reg! <laughs> when he said that to me on that phone that day, everything was okay. And I told him from my heart, I'll try. <laughs> but I had so much to work through, things got worse before they got better. So I actually wound up admitting myself into another psychiatric ward. Now I'm in loony bin number two, and guess who showed up as a patient? It was Mike Tyson. <laughs> and I know it's fucked up to say that, right? But he doesn't mind a bit. The fact is I was locked up in a psychiatric ward with the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world who I had done a whole bunch of drugs with back in the day. Yeah, years ago, I watched Mike Tyson smoke more coke than I've ever seen anybody smoke. I was so impressed, I just kept giving him more. <laughs> yeah. We burned through five grams, and when it was gone, I was like, you win. <laughs> so I was not shocked to see Mike show up at that hospital. Tonight. I was happy to see you, because I've been there a couple of times, I haven't seen anybody that I knew. <laughs> oh so I'm there, and I was happy I've seen somebody that I knew, so that yeah. was pretty cool. And the truth is, I was thrilled, because I wanted so badly to film a stunt with him when we got out. The whole time we're in there, I'm pitching it to him, saying, Mike, all I need you to do is hold your fist out and let me run into it with my face. It's called the black eye game, and I've never lost. As hard as I tried, all Mike would say was, I don't want to hurt you, Steve. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> and I couldn't talk him into it at that time, but it was just as well. I had much more important shit to worry about, like learning how to live without drugs and booze. And I wanted my life to get better desperately. So I went back to rehab. And I buckled down. I worked so hard. Even in my free time, I went out on a pass to meet up with Johnny Knoxville to try to make amends to all the people around the world who I had kicked in the balls and not let them kick me back. <laughs> so I met up with Knoxville. I got butt naked. He took off his one shoe and sock. I'm gonna kick those old rusty peaches barefooted. <laughs> With a barefoot, he kicked my bare dick and balls so fucking hard. I'm Steve-O, and I'm an alcoholic drug addict. Gone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's what you get for doing drugs, kids. And that was my first real amends. I took the whole process so seriously. Of course, I had to try to meet up with my old neighbor, who politely declined. And that broke my heart because I wanted to talk to him so bad and make things right and ask him how he describes having been my neighbor. Does he say, you ever see The Shining? <laughs> as dedicated to my recovery as I was, I didn't want to work at all. I just wanted to hide out in my dingy little halfway house. But then Knoxville calls. He says, we're making Jackass 3D. Are you in? And I said, it's not like I can turn down only the third good job I've ever been offered. <laughs> of course I did it. But I quickly learned that there's something about filming a jackass movie when you're newly clean and sober that sucks. I had to do all this crazy life-threatening bullshit with a newfound sense of clarity and concern for my health. And in those early days, I was so uptight about my health. Oh, I'd go jogging before we filmed, eat all my organic veggies on the set. One day, we're sitting there with our brother, Ryan Dunn. God rest his soul. <laughs> Ryan was so funny. He looks at me. He says, you went from eating crack off of dead hookers to raw broccoli? What the fuck? <laughs> And that pretty much sums up what I was like on that movie. So when it was my job to get inside a porta potty that was chock full of shit and then get catapulted up into the sky, you know what I did before I got in that porta potty? I jacked up. <laughs> now, I, I put on a pair of swimming goggles and a nose plug. Look pretty happy about it. I even stuffed earplugs into my ears. The question is, why did I bother, considering as soon as they launched that thing, I was screaming my head off with my mouth wide open. It looked like a game of fucking Pac-Man in there. We played back the video right away, and Knoxville said, if your mouth wasn't so wide open, that poo might have hit you in the face. <laughs> and another day on the set of that movie, it was really important to me to try to shoot my nipple off with a BB gun. The director and pretty much everybody else knew this idea was way too dark and fucked up to ever include in the movie, but they let me do it anyway because it was a convenient way to keep me in one spot in front of the super slow motion camera so my buddy Bam could throw water in my face while he sucker punched me in super slow-mo. So sure enough, Wee Man fires the BB into my nipple. Fire! <laughs> Fuck. Is it in there? <laughs> what? 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 Oh! Wow. It is still in there to this day. Can you feel where the BB is? Yeah, look! Right, right there. Oh, wow. And it's spouting blood, and I'm like, whoa! And here comes the water. <laughs> Bam, sucker punches me so hard, he completely broke my nose. I was so fucking pissed about that for so long. The last time I saw Bam, I snuck up behind him. How do you write a ticket for somebody duct taped to the side of a bus? <laughs> What's the fine? I threw water in his face, and then I learned that I punched like a serious pussy. <laughs> I felt like I was in a dream or something. <laughs> and look. <laughs> it was so awful, man. That hurt me more than him. I've seen people high five harder than that. <laughs> When Bam broke my nose, I fumed about it for two months until I finally snapped. I said, I don't like the way it looks, I'm getting it fixed, and the movie's paying for it. <laughs> so I went to this fancy Beverly Hills nose doctor. He says, I would love to help you, but it's been two months. It's already healed like that. If you want me to fix it now, he says, I'm gonna have to re-break it with a chisel and then set it straight. So I told him, it doesn't bug me that much. 
And I lived with my crooked ass nose for another whole year until the Comedy Central roast of Charlie Sheen. Your nose is like my ass. There's nothing you won't shove up there. <laughs> and guess who was there? Motherfucking Mike Tyson. And I was not about to let Mike off the hook so easy this time. I called up the agent who booked us both. I said, motherfucker, you're telling Mike he's holding out his fist and I'm running into it with my face. <laughs> and that did the trick. So the last thing that happened on stage at the Charlie Sheen roast, Mike Tyson held out his fist. That thing is so big, it looks like that. <laughs> And I went sprinting for it. I dove face first. Bullseye. Come on, Steve Don't hurt me! Oh, shit. And Mike leaned into it just enough to leave my nose parked under my right eye. It was just like... <laughs> it was so broken. And I went through a lot of emotions in that moment. Starting with, ouch. And then I'm on the ground, I'm thinking, this might be the coolest thing that has ever happened. Maybe I'm gonna be so fucking famous for this. Ah. And as I'm getting up, I can see with my own eyes, my nose is nowhere near where it's supposed to be. Broken nose. And a wave of panic comes over me. I'm thinking, I'm gonna look terrible forever. And it starts gushing blood. I'm trying to play it off like I'm really happy about all this. Like, but the truth is that I was embarrassed because I could see all the celebrities thinking that was really creepy. <laughs> yeah. Kilo. Yeah. What I the feel. fuck? And I'm standing there bleeding. Everybody's getting up and starting to leave. But there's one dude in the crowd just hollering, Steve-O, your nose needs to be set right now. And that sounds right. So I turn to the guy filled with hope. And he goes, I'm a Kung Fu instructor. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> And I'm like, fuck, so close. And now I have to make a difficult decision on the spot. All I could come up with was, I don't think he's gonna make it look worse. <laughs> so I trusted him, sat on the edge of the stage. He put a thumb on either side of my nose and just wrenched it back into the middle, not gentle. He kept mushing it and smashing it and fucking with it until he kung fu'd that shit just about perfect. <laughs> I got a Mike Tyson Kung Fu nose job for free. <laughs> and the craziest part of the story by far is that both me and Mike Tyson have now been clean and sober for years. And nobody saw that coming, right? What are the odds of that? That's like both Cheech and Chong becoming DEA agents. And there's only one way that I know about that sober people can stay sober, is by helping other people get sober. So I knew I needed to find some people to help. One day I went to this rehab, I'm talking to this kid. I asked him, what's your drug of choice? He says, I shoot heroin. And I told him, man, I've never even laid eyes on that stuff. And I feel so lucky, because I think all I would have taken would have been one super hot chick to offer me heroin, and I would probably be addicted to it too. And the kid got all sad. He says, all it took for me was one ugly dude. <laughs> I don't think I helped him at all. <laughs> but I've kept trying, and I'm pretty sure that's the only reason I'm still alive today. And I am so grateful for my sobriety. When I first got sober, I was scared shitless that it was gonna make me become boring, that I was gonna turn into a pussy. But thankfully, I stayed dumb. <laughs> Terrible ideas continue to flow through my head, and I'm pretty good about going through with them. <laughs> Except sometimes I've had really bad luck. Like recently, I broke both of my feet. I mangled my right ankle so badly, it is now held together with a plate and nine screws. This happened while I was standing on top of a porta potty while my buddy crashed a car through it and I was trying to land on a skateboard. It was a fucking freak accident. 
It's my luck. Another time I was in the ocean in Peru, I pulled a humongous jellyfish out of the water, plopped it on my head, the fucking thing attacked me. Ow! 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 Shit! <laughs> and very recently I had maybe the worst luck I've ever had. I decided it was time to blow up a bunch of bombs and fire explosions in my living room at home. Yeah, dude, it's my house. So I emptied out the living room. Started off with this fucking bomb that can easily take your arm off. I put it inside a watermelon. I held that watermelon in my bare hand and boom, fucking coolest thing you ever saw. <laughs> and I was fine. So then I moved on to the rocket engine fuel. It's this gunpowder looking shit. It is super volatile, a really bad idea to play with. My first rocket engine fuel stunt was called the invisible musical chair. I thought that shit was fucking hilarious, but I was fine, I was, I was okay. So then I moved on to the hot teacup. still I was unscathed so now I'm thinking well I got to get kind of hurt <laughs> so we just sprinkled way too much rocket engine fuel all over the living room carpet and I laid in it and did snow angels <laughs> except I called it fire angels and with the name that cute what could go wrong fire angels yay <laughs> well Thing was, I wasn't wearing anything except jeans and a t-shirt. No fire gel, nothing. So when my buddies lit that stuff, right away I knew I fucked up. <laughs> Before the flames were even out, the whole back of my shirt had disappeared. Oh my God. Woo! Along with a bunch of skin, and right away I knew it was bad. This one's gonna fucking hurt for a little bit. But I'm thinking, I've been burned before. Years ago, I had a terrible accident. Burned the skin off of half my face, and I got through that. So I'm just gonna power through this. I'll be cool. The next morning, I woke up with the most hideous, fucked up blisters. Shit that I have not seen, not on anybody else, not on the internet, not anywhere, was all over 15% of my body. Roughly the surface area of my penis. <laughs> <laughs> the skin just starts falling off of me, huge swaths of it, and I'm throwing it into the toilet until the point when it occurred to me, that looks remarkable. And I got my girlfriend to start filming. As I pulled my own skin out of the toilet water, I said, I should not eat this. And she goes, why not? <laughs> You're on antibiotics anyway, right? <laughs> and if that's not proof that she is the one, <laughs> Considering the situation, we really had a pretty good time that first day. But each day after that, the pain got worse and worse. Turns out with third degree burns, the damage deepens and spreads and the pain becomes more excruciating. When I got to day five, it was officially the most pain I have ever been in in my life and that's me saying that. I fucking tapped out. I showed up at the hospital begging for some kind of numbing cream to smear all over myself because I'm a sober dude and I don't want painkillers. So they said, we've got something like that, but let's just check you in and get you looked at. The doctors looked at me, they were like, fuck! What the hell have you been doing for the last five days, you idiot? You need emergency surgery. So they asked me, when's the last time I ate? I was like, I just ate a bunch of my skin. <laughs> no, really, I, I had a meal. So they told me that they could not operate on me for another eight hours, at which point my sobriety was slightly less crucial. I was like, please, can I have painkillers? Please, please, please. And they said, of course. 
but they had to give them to me through an IV. And my arms were so burnt, they put the IV in my neck. Now, let me tell you what it's like to be a sober drug addict in a hospital shooting up all these great drugs right into your neck. It's like being a pedophile in Chuck E. Cheese. It's dangerous and exciting, and it feels so good. And that got me into surgery. Here's where it gets crazy. The purpose of the operation was to carve the burns off of my body. I don't know if they used a potato peeler or what, but they cut off the burns and then grafted on cadaver skin. I shit you not, I had the flesh of exactly seven different dead people grafted onto my body, which is new meaning for give me some skin. <laughs> And it gets even crazier. At the hospital, after the operation, they gave me the addresses of all seven different families of the dead people who donated their skin so that I could send thank you cards. <laughs> Finally, something Hallmark does not have a card for. <laughs> And as soon as I got those addresses, right away, I was like, I'm going to reach out to these families. You know, maybe some of them are having a tough time, and I can help them out. Maybe one of them has a big fan, and I can meet that person. I want to do some good. My dad heard that, and he made a really good point. He said, what family do you think is going to be happy to learn that their loved one's skin got wasted on an asshole who set himself on fire on purpose? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, Dad, you're right. <laughs> Fuck those people. <laughs> and you know, my dad was right. I want to thank him again. So, Dad, come on back out, as well as everybody who we had on stage tonight. Thank you all so much. <laughs> now, real quick, I got something that's kind of important. If anybody saw my first crazy comedy special, then you'll know that it was largely about me working on becoming a guy who can be in a healthy relationship. And as I just said before, I think I found the fucking one, man. So I want you guys to meet her. If I can get my beautiful girlfriend Lux to come out here. And, and I'm just telling you, babe, as long as we've been together, there has never been one moment where I doubted that you were the one. <laughs> Lux right. will you marry me? <laughs> Before we continue with these outtakes slash credits, I want to sincerely thank you for caring enough to watch this project. It is my baby. And I also want to thank the fuckface dickheads who could have released it but didn't think it belonged on their platform. Those people pissed me off, man, and motivated me, which is the story of my life. And if you're interested in the story, I autograph every single copy at stevo.com, making very sure that every autograph looks just like a penis. You think there's a lot of drugs and fucked up shit in this special. Wait till you get the book. But enough of that. You accomplished gnarly for sure. You no know one's gonna notice. You know that photo I texted to Knoxville? Well, here it is on a magic pen. Right side up, I got solid black shorts. Turn it upside down. It's a magic dick pic pen. Get yours now at stevo.com. I, I, I actually, the condom is probably worse than the condom.
This is my punishment for getting that tattoo. They burnt half the fucking thing off. Oh my god. I want to thank Johnny Knoxville, oh. Jeff Tremaine, and the Jackass crew for saving my life on March 9th, 2008. I also want to thank my three best friends, Scott, Sam, and Tommy, uh, just for being the fucking best, man. I want to thank my family, of course, my girlfriend, and for you for watching this special. Cheers. Have a good one. I'm just gonna take it. <laughs> I'm not gonna bark. Thank you for watching. <laughs> You're still here, and that means the world to me. So I want to show you the shirt I was wearing when I got burned up in the living room. See how torched it is? And you know those nine screws in my ankle? It was actually 11, and I got them out and had them mounted into this cool model. There they all are, the actual ones. I'm so proud of that. And this fucking project was so much work and nobody believed in me. But you guys, I'm telling you, if you're a member of the media, please let people know about it. And if you have an Instagram, Facebook, or a Twitter, you are a member of the media. So without stealing any actual footage, please just like maybe a screenshot or something and put it out there and let people know, man. And I got nothing else, dude. You stay till the end and I love you. So one last push. Oh. Ah.